we are getting into more and more and more symbolisms that are going to become more and more complex as the book continues. First thing I'd take, like to take a look at today is just one more example of what I mean by uh, the kinds of symbolisms we see sometimes in things that are around us. When I was in college, one of the things that I had to read in an early American lit class was a little bit of Emily Dickinson. I'm going to show you, uh, you're going to listen, you're going to see the words and hear it, hear it spoken, a short poem by Emily Dickinson, and we're going to spend just two or three minutes just looking, get our minds wrapped around the idea that this poem, like Re Revelation, is highly full of symbolism, okay? Um, so, <coughs> Aaron, there we go, all right. Because I could not, because I could death. not stop for death. Because I could, because not I could for not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held, the carriage but, just held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove. We slowly he, drove. Knew no he knew no and haste, I and I had put away and my labor my and too. my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school. We passed the school where children their played. Lessons their lessons done. scarcely done. We passed the fields, we passed of, the gazing fields of gazing grain. grain. We passed sun. the setting sun. We paused before, we paused a, house before a house that seemed a swelling in the, the ground. Roof the roof visible. was scarcely the visible, but the cornice, but a mound. Since then to centuries, Since then, to centuries. but each feels shorter, feel shorter than the day I first the surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. I know we heard that in stereo, but hopefully you could read it and hear it enough. All right, here's some summary points. What is this, what is this poem about? I got a good answer, but it was a question at the same time, all right? I'm not, I'm not making fun, I'm just saying that the only answer I got was a question. Death, okay? What's some key things maybe that make us believe that that might be, might be the case? Okay, the last sentence. Sometimes with these, you have to go through, whether it's something like Revelation or whether it's something like a poem or something like a lot of music that's written by a real good uh, author uh, or a movie even. Sometimes we don't get it until the end. That, that's, that's the case a lot. Um, okay, so you're looking for some key words. See, she's not coming right out and saying what she means, is she? All right? She's using symbolisms to do so. And when we were in school, the teacher would blab at us about what those symbols mean, and we would go, yeah, yeah, fall asleep, take the test, hopefully pass it. Some people would get it, but I know I never did until I took a really good class in college from a guy that explained why all that was true, um, which kind of changed my mind towards literature and, and a lot of other things over time. So, <clears throat> just to go through a few things here. Because I could not stop for death. What does that mean? We don't have a choice. All right? He, she could have said, I'm going to die. But she says, because I could not stop for death. Instead. Kindly stop for me. Death is like a gentleman. There's civility involved. All right? It's not that he's upset with you. It's just something that happens. Um... um Immortality, of course, is, is an important one. Um, the idea here is probably that she sees that death is not the end, all right? That there is something beyond that. There's immortality beyond the grave. Slowly, um, we slowly drove. He knew no haste. Notice that the word changes in between there from we to he. There's a switch, all right? He, who is it referring to? death. She's with that death uh, uh, object or that uh, entity, but she's now talking about him, the he of it. My labor or my work or my leisure, that's what she had to exchange. 
the things of life. And then it goes down and it says we passed a school where children played. Their lessons scarcely done. We passed um, the uh, fields of... Uh, what, what is it that that's talking about? It's talking about the things of life that go by. Before death, maybe even after death. We pause before a house that seemed a swelling in the ground. What is that? Have no idea. The grave. The grave. It goes on and it says, The roof was scarcely visible, its cornice, but a mound. It's the grave. She just didn't say, Terry, this, you, you need to get out more. This is the reason why we don't understand Revelation, guys. Do you see what I'm saying? This is the exact reason why we do not understand Revelation, is we don't understand this kind of writing. Okay? Thank you. Seriously. Thank you. She's gone. Yeah. Um, where, where is that part? Yeah, the setting sun is going to be, it's like going from children to the setting sun is where you're going off like the, like the old cowboy back into the sunset. All right? Since then, tis centuries, but each feels shorter than a day. What's happening there? Eternity. And it's also given us the first indication that she's not alive. This is after she's dead. And it's been a while. Um... And it says uh, that I first surmised, surmised, since I first surmised that the horse's heads were towards eternity. Okay? She could have said, I died. I'm okay with it. My new house is a grave forever. Kind of a bump in the ground, but death is not the, only, is not the end. And believe me, time really flies on the other side of eternity. She could have just said that. But she said it in flamboyant language. She said it in language that actually you can dig into and you can see more and more meaning. That is what is happening in Revelation. Okay? And if you miss that, you're never going to understand it. Trust me. Because I didn't for years. I think it's one reason I've never liked poetry. <laughs> None of us have liked poetry. Amen. None of us. At least the guys have never liked poetry. But like I said, I had an excellent instructor for early American literature in college. And I also liked writing music. And I was able to combine the two. And eventually, over time, I figured out this is important, and it's even important in the Bible. Because the Bible writers were using these kinds of gimmicks, if you can call them a gimmick. There once was a thing, na na na, da 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 da, right? That's not good poetry. Yep. You can still write good poetry with those, but anyway, we got to move on. In chapter 4, we saw the throne room of God opened up and uh, revealed in a way only symbols could describe. The scene that is depicted cannot be uh, carved out of wood or out of stone. The true God of the universe is indescribable. That is part of the splendor of an all-powerful God who is invisible to the physical eye. Because any attempt to form him into something tangible limits his omnipresence, his omnipotence, and his omniscience, which means it limits his being all-present, all-powerful, and all-knowing. Here, God's throne is the beings um, that surround it and uh, the praise that is due him are all there, hidden in the words that come directly from the Old Testament. Why was God worthy of being praised? Remember, this comes from, comes from um, the last chapter uh, that we did last week. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, we heard, Worthy art thou our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created. There's the reason. You created all things, and because of uh, your will, they exist and were created. The heavenly worship 
described in chapter 4 continues uninterrupted into chapter 5. Uh, the one we saw seated on the throne in chapter 4, verse 2, is now pictured um, with a scroll. Sometimes called a book in some translations, but basically back then they didn't have books like ours. They had scrolls. And the seal that's shown here uh, was kind of like as a, as a wax impression, and it, made, it was made, always made by the one that had sent the document. So this is the kind of seal we're probably talking about that is being described because it was very familiar to the people then. This is equivalent to looking a stamp nowadays, but it's more important because a stamp, the stamp was the mark of the sender. And if the king had his stamp on it, you better not open it unless you have authority to do so. But this scroll had seven seals. Um, inside and out, it had writing. And um, it is sealed uh, in this manner knowing that it is an important document and should not be opened, really should not be opened, you better not open it. Because there's not just one seal. There's an important number, seven, number of seals. Um, seven seals show the importance of this document. Only the intended recipient uh, could break these seals. Revelation chapter 5, verses uh, 2 through 4. And I saw a mighty angel proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Let's look at Daniel chapter 12. Verse 4 and verse 9. God says, Daniel, shut up the works and seal the book until the time of the end. Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Or as we've said before, the end times or the last days. Hmm. Look at this. Again, there is an uncanny resemblance between what John and what Daniel writes. Daniel, uh, in his vision, uh, his visions were speaking of a time when the Messiah would come. Remember, we said that Daniel's not predicting the end of the world like some people think. Daniel was predicting when Jesus was going to come. That was his purpose. <clears throat> And that's why he couldn't know what it was because God wasn't revealing that yet. So Daniel was told at the very end of his book, shut the book up, it's sealed. You're not going to know what's in it. I'm not going to tell you. Now, during the time of John, uh, that John is writing, Revelation, um, the time is finally right. We see in Isaiah chapter uh, 29, similar words are used. Just prior to uh, chapter 29, Isaiah is speaking of the doom of both um, Assyria and uh, Israel. Verse 6 says, You will be visited by the Lord of hosts with thunder and with, a, with earthquake <coughs> um, and great noise, with whirlwind and tempest and flame uh, of a devouring fire. And then later on, in the same chapter, down in verse 11, he says this, And the vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it uh, to one who can read it, uh, uh, saying, Read this, and he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. Prophetically, <clears throat> these passages refer to when the end time, um, the end time, the time we're living in now, will come and are associated with <clears throat> divine judgment against those that refuse to follow God, Jew and Gentile alike. But Isaiah and Daniel are uh, being told that it is not time to know when, um, what these writings are about. What is being written is going to be sealed until the time is right. It is just 
Um, a or sorry, is it just a coincidence that these Old Testament prophets are sealing something that John is witnessing uh, being unsealed? And I don't think that's the case. Uh, do you think that <clears throat> it is something intentional? Keep in mind that um, just like all other Old Testament prophecy, both Daniel and Ezekiel are prophetically uh, looking forward to a time for the, uh, when the promised seed would come. And like we've discussed last week and, and at other times, Revelation chapter 4 and 5 follow a structural outline identical uh, to uh, Daniel chapter 7 and Ezekiel chapter 1 and 2. We, we talked about that quite a bit last week. Um, it's like my brother has always said, we kind of do this back and forth, it's sometimes at the end of our emails when we're pointing something like this out to each other. He says, do you think that the Bible is just, just might be a book that's got like just one story through the whole thing? And it's true. These are the kinds of things that show it. The scroll John sees needs to be opened. Like a last will and testament, it must be opened so that what is inside can be carried out. Gregory Beale says that wills during this ancient time when John um, was, uh, uh, was living were witnessed and sealed with seven seals and that the contents were often summarized in writing on the outside of the document, which makes me come to wonder whether or not the writing that was, it says that this writing was on the inside and out, the outside that John seen, uh, sees could be a summary of what's on the inside. It could be what Daniel and the others that were looking at this in the Old Testament saw and didn't get enough and knew that there was something happening and wanted to see the inside of it because they didn't understand. That's speculation, but it's very possible. That might explain why Daniel was distraught when he could not see what was inside the book. He may have been able to read the summary but not fully understand the document. In this manner, the breaking of the seals would denote not only a fuller revelation of the prophetic fulfillment in Christ, but also the execution of the contents of the scroll. Therefore, the question posed by the angelic being and the response that's given in verses 2 through 4 concern who is able not only to unveil the contents of the document uh, together with their meaning, but also who is worthy to be able to open it and see what's inside. God's response to Daniel's question about how and when the prophecies would be fulfilled uh, was sealed up and the book wouldn't be open until end time. But now in Revelation, what we see, uh, we see that the highly anticipated answer to Daniel's question is coming, and that it is Christ's death and resurrection that began the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies. Therefore, it is now, after all of human uh, history, that the seals can finally be opened and removed. But there's a problem, like we said. Who's worthy to open this book? And the problem was so great that verse uh, 2, uh, we see a strong, powerful angel. And what does he say? Who is worthy to open the scrolls and break the seal? Break the seals. He's yelling this as loud as he can. This is important and nobody can do it. It's like there's a tension building throughout this part of this passage. It seems that no one in heaven or earth or anywhere else is able to open it. Remember, who is holding onto this scroll in his right hand? God himself. God's not opening, guys. He's looking for somebody that's worthy to do so. The one who created all things is holding onto this in his right hand. The one worthy of praise and worship from the last chapter. But no one is found worthy of opening the scroll. 
This event was so anticipated and the problem seemed so insolvable that John begins to break down and weep. Remember, John lived with Jesus on earth for a little over three years. And he witnessed the death and the resurrection. And by now, he had been writing and teaching and preaching these things for probably about 50 years. John had dedicated, he was a young man when he met Jesus. He had dedicated his whole life to this. He doesn't see that the seals can be opened. People that John knew desired to know these things. Um, Prophets of old died not knowing what was in this book. And presently, the seven churches that he talks about at the beginning needed to know the things written on its pages. But the problem is... John is on an island. About 30 miles off the coastline. They don't have motor boats. He can't even get a boat. And he's even farther away from all those seven churches, which are in red, outlined. He's on the dot. There's the mainland. There's the churches. Um... And it seems that there is no one worthy to even take it out of the right hand of God, let alone to open it. Now remember, a ruler does not do his own bidding. The king of England does not wash his own car, nor does he mow his own lawn. He's got people for that. And as we looked at at many times, I think we've been by this in Nathan's class already, uh, there was a um, authority that Jesus talked to in Matthew chapter 8, and he says, he was a Roman centurion, for I myself of a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and I tell this one, come, and he comes, and I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When a ruler sitting on a throne needs something done, he delegates the task to someone else. But here we find God, the creator of the universe, sitting on his throne with a great task that needs to be performed, and there's nobody worthy that they can find. Then, beginning in Revelation chapter 5, uh, verse 9, we read this. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lamb of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seals and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven uh, eyes which were the seven spirits of God uh, sent out upon the earth and he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, uh, each holding a harp and a golden bowl uh, full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. This is going to be important in in the coming passages, knowing what that is. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood uh, you ransomed people uh, for God from every nation, from every tribe, language, and people of every nation. There's a lot to unpack in that, but there is one thing that is of utmost importance. One thing that should stand out more than um, anything else. It is the character introduced by one of the 24 elders. The character is described in symbols like Emily Dickinson would do or any other good poet or songwriter. A lion of the tribe of Judah for the, from the root of David. A lamb that was slain but is still standing. One who is, has conquered, uh, who has Uh, uh, Who is this talking about, we could ask ourselves. And as Christians, we should already know, okay? 
But if somebody's reading the book from the beginning, never heard of Christianity, this is the climax of the book. This is that person, the person that was talked about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the person that was witnessed by the apostles as ascending to heaven. Now we know for sure, for the first time while reading this book, exactly who that character is because of the symbolisms from the Old Testament. Okay, so let's go through a couple of these descriptions. In Genesis chapter 49, this goes all the way back to Genesis, guys. The descriptions go all the way through the entire Bible. In Genesis chapter 49, we read about the final blessings given by Jacob to his 12 sons. And in Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 12, Jacob is speaking directly to his son, Judah. He says, you are a lion's cub, uh, Judah, you return from the prey, my son. Let a lion, like a lion, you crouch um, and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be this, shall be his. Who is that talking about? They wouldn't have known that back at the time when Jacob was speaking this. But we should know it by now. Jacob speaks to Judah referring to, in, in that time span, referring to when he let his staff, uh, among other things, be taken by Tamar, Tamar uh, as a pledge uh, of payment. But the blessing continues, and Jacob refers to Judah as a lion's cub, that uh, his staff, staff will uh, never again be taken away. Who's that staff? The staff is the staff of a ruler, the staff of a king, and it's through Judah at this point that the Messiah would come. That's who the direct reference here is to. All the way back in Genesis, they were given that clue, they were given that hint, but they didn't understand until it was revealed later on. When we move on to Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, we see that a covenant was made where uh, David's son would set on the throne and that he would be called the son of God. And in Psalms 110, uh, that real famous one that we keep talking about, David himself says that it would uh, be his descendant who would be king and lord and that his descendant would sit on the right hand of the father. And then in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, he speaks of a shoot of a branch of Jesse, and that the spirit of Jehovah would rest on him. If you remember who is Jesse, it's David's father. Okay, we've all just talked about David. Now Isaiah, later on, after David had lived, looks back and talks about the shoot of Jesse, which is David. And why is this important? Because it was through David that we see the lineage of the son come through. Okay, we got all these names. If you remember my Genesis class, we went one after another after another, and that all the way through the book of Genesis, the important people that led directly uh, to the uh, Messiah. David is another one that does this. It is this one who John sees standing in the midst of the throne. Uh, the idea that he was slain is an allusion to both the Passover lamb and also to this passage in Isaiah or to a passage in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, both of which point to a better sacrifice uh, that was to come. The slain lamb, rep lamb represents the image of a conqueror who has been mortally wounded while defeating an enemy. The horns dis, uh, dis, um, designate, can't read my own writing sometimes, even though it's typed. <laughs> horns designate power in such places as Deuteronomy chapter 33 and Psalms chapter 89. This lamb's seven horns signify its power and might. Therefore, who is being described in Genesis chapter 49, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, Psalms number, uh, chapter 110, is, uh, Isaiah chapter 11, uh, Isaiah chapter 53, and all these others. It's who he's bringing up here. 
He's using this flowery language. He's just not saying, hey, Jesus is here and he can open the scrolls. He's using Emily Dixon-like language to do this. He's using the symbols. He's using the descriptions that come from the Old Testament. We're going to talk later on as to why he does this, uh, but just know for now that he does. Okay, so we know from the symbols that he's talking about Jesus. How do we know this? Because John is quoting or alluding to verses, verse after verse, from the Old Testament that make direct references to this promised seed. The one who was promised over a thousand years before John was ever born. Thousands of years. The son of man spoken, by, uh, spoken of by Daniel. The son of God. He is the lion. He is the lamb that was slain, yet still stands. He is the one who has conquered. John is using symbolic language along with much tension and mystery to develop this and to tell us that the only one who is worthy uh, to open the seven seals is the one and only Jesus the Christ. And why? Because it, has, um, it is he that was promised. He was foretold. He conquered. Um, but what was it that he has conquered? John is told, look. But when he looks, what does he see? He sees a lamb. This lamb has conquered. He has overcome something. But in doing so, he came out looking um, not like any lamb. He looks like a slaughtered lamb. Not a weak lamb, but he's a bloody lamb that's not dead. But also, he's like a lion of the tribe of Judah. He is not a tame lion, and he is not a weak lamb. Many Passover lambs were killed year after year. They were slain, they were eaten, but they never lived again. But this lamb that was dead, and uh, now he is alive. Revelation is telling us that the Lion of Judah is the lamb. Making a connection there, an important connection. The long-promised son of David from the tribe of Judah is the lamb. Remember uh, that the call came uh, for one who was worthy to open the seals, and no one in heaven or earth could, was, up to the, was uh, found to be uh, up to that job. So, where did this lamb that is worthy come from? And what we see is that his appearance comes from the middle of the throne. That's important, too. But, if you remember, this is God's throne. The throne is described as unimproachable. Remember the um, sea of glass and crystal? Very delicate. But what we see here is that the lamb is coming from the throne. He's already made it to the other side. This bloody lamb had already made it to the other side of the sea of glass. In chapter 4, we saw that the holy God that created all things was sitting on this throne in the middle of that sea of glass. Uh, but here we see this lion who looks like a lamb coming from that throne. And why does he do that? Because he is one with this God. John tells us, the guy that's writing Revelation tells us at the beginning of his gospel, that exact same thing. Because the word was God and in doing that, he created all things. It is this very word, the very son that is uh, deity slain, that reaches out and takes this book from the Father's right hand. So, what happens next? What happens next in that passage we just read? Heaven and everybody goes nuts basically, in our own language, okay? In chapter 4, uh, we saw uh, the four beings fall and worship God on his throne. But here, in chapter 5, they worship again. 
But this time, they fall before the Lamb, and the singing begins. And they sing a song that has never been sung before. In fact, Revelation calls it a new song. Revelation chapter 5, starting in verse 9, it says, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed, you ransomed people for God uh, from every tribe and language um, and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign forever on earth. Um, There's no way in the world I'd ever be able to read that and do it justice. I think that this was louder than the thunder and the lightning that was on Mount Sinai that the people shied away from. Like I said, heaven and earth went nuts when they finally figured this out. It says that people of all nations have been made a kingdom of priests and that they will reign But this is exactly what Daniel had predicted uh, would happen back in Daniel chapter um, 7, where he says, (coughs) from two different verses, 22 and 27, the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints received the kingdom. And in verse 27 it says, and the kingdom and the uh, and dominion and the greatness of the king of kingdoms under the whole earth shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey them daniel was telling what john was experiencing but what the elders are singing about <clears throat> goes even further back In Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, God tells Israel through Moses that if they obey his voice and keep his covenant, and that was not in here, keep his covenant that you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is, has been God's plan from the very beginning. The notion of kingdom and priesthood have now been universalized and woven, therefore, to be understood that the true church, Israel is is, uh, meant to be the true church. True Israel is the church. And now that there is one worthy to break the seals, it's time to rejoice. What we are hearing at the ends of both chapter 4 and of chapter 5 are doxologies. Doxologies, of course, um, are hymns or anthems, and they're used for the purpose of glorification, praise, and worship. This is part of the structure uh, of this doxology. And um, as you you, uh, might read down through these, we got time to read a few. Went faster than I thought today. Um, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, uh, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Who was that one talking about? Okay. Chapter 4, in fact, talks about the Father. So the first two, 4.8 and 4.11, are in the first chapter. They're talking about God the Father. The next two, uh, 5.9 and 5.12, who are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus. Worthy are you to receive the book, for you were slain. You see the change there in the praise? Worthy is the lamb, in verse 12 of chapter 5, that was slain to receive power and riches uh, and wisdom and might, etc., etc. And then, at the very end, compared with the very beginning, look what happens. See those highlighted parts? These doxologies begin and end with the same thing. Just a little tool I think John used. He says, who was and is uh, and is to come. That same idea of the I am. And then at the end, he ends with uh, both of them, 
uh, dominion forever and ever. Okay? Same idea. Same exact thoughts. This is because it, was fi- it has finally been made known uh, that it is he that is worthy to open the seals of the book. Um, so, why do I have a slide there? Oh, that's the, okay. I confused myself. This praise fest or doxology began with the four living creatures and then continues to the 24 elders. And next, uh, they're joined by an innumerable number of angelic beings. So it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as it goes on. So that by the time we get to Revelations 5 verse 13, it says, And I heard every creature on heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb uh, be blessings and honor and glory and might forever and ever. This is exactly as it always should have been right from the beginning of Genesis. But of course we saw the fall of man in Genesis and it has ever since been the goal um, to bring man back to this, what we're, what we're seeing here. Um, uh, and and, and we, we see it in the, uh, the one that is worthy to uh, take the scroll and open the seals. Back in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23, it says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. This was something that was told of by the prophets long ago the prophets foretold of it john is forth telling it or telling it that it's happening now and even paul in philippians says so that at the name of jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue shall confess that jesus is lord to the glory of the of god the father and so we see a giant burst of doxology and praise because the long-awaited seed, the one who is worthy to open the seals, is finally found, and heaven and earth can no longer contain itself. Any questions? Yes. Uh, Chapters? You're telling me that you really do understand Emily Dickinson, then. In a way, you are. I'm understanding symbolism, but I still don't like poetry. Well, I don't blame you for not liking poetry, but you, you get the idea, at least. Oh, yeah, I understand symbols. You know, if you don't, like you said, if you don't understand symbols, you have a hard time from Genesis through the end of Revelation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else? All right. Thank you. We're going to be in, what was this chapter, five? We're going to, we're going to be in chapter six next week if you want to read it. <laughs>